the making of the 144,000 and a perfected people by Dr. Eman, the electric man. Um, it assumes that you, we had looked at some of the text before, that we have read certain sections of the Bible, and we had gotten certain part of our book, People of Color in the Bible. All right, now if we turn to Revelation chapter 7, that's where we're going to begin. That's where the Bible actually defines the 144,000. Now, um, in the last section, I wanted to make some parallels into that we have to walk with Elohim as it is, was mentioned as Adam did in the cool of the day. And as it was mentioned that even after the fall that Enoch did, and we hear about perfection, um, Adam and Eve were created as perfect beings because the Bible says that they were created in the image of Elohim. So if they're created in the image of God, then they were made perfect. And at that point, they was to reveal Yahweh to the universe, to the angels, to everything, to the animals and so forth. So that when they see the Bible talks about, I think Yeshua mentioned in the New Testament, when you see Yeshua, when you see him, you see the Father. And in the Bible it says, in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so inside of Yeshua was the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, that's a whole study all by itself of how that actually works out. But I did want to make mention, if the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Yeshua bodily, in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, then what does that mean? Well, we it's the same situation that we have. Some people believe that Yeshua was created above us, and he was not really human, and all of that stuff. Even though he was God, was he human when he came to earth? Or did he come with all of the God's power and then he was not like us? That's a debate that's out there. Now, the, court, the, the reasoning for that is why does, I mean, why does someone concern himself with was he created like us? Or was he just created perfect and then he came perfect and so there was really no contest of him ever falling? Or was there the opportunity that if he comes like us after the fall, that he had the same choice as Adam and Eve did to choose right or wrong? So that's where um, the reason why that question comes up. And then depending on that, that would determine if humans, us, in our fallen state, can we be brought back to what he brought Adam and Eve to, brought us, bring us back to perfection? And then how does that process actually occur through examples of scriptures of people who have done it in the past and how Yahweh had perfected them and brought them to their different states of being? And how did they look at it? Now, in the book of Job, Job was, even though Elohim says that he was perfect, he considered, he said that he, if he thought he was perfect, he would, you know, he would be ashamed of that, or he would, um, um, it was um, really tricky. I mean, he was really um, concerned about that. And so when people are saying that they, you know, they're perfect and all of that, they don't um, reveal the attributes of people who Yahweh, who said they were perfect. So there's two different things that we're talking about here. And... Um, we have to be careful because he does call us to perfection. Well, let's, before I get to the 144,000 over there, I want to backtrack on Job. You can turn with me to Job chapter 9, where this is discussed in, in some great detail, just so that we can get a feel of what the Bible is saying. So when we talk, we know we read in Job 1.1 1, 1, that the Bible says that Job was perfect perfect person, how do they look at their condition? In Job chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then Job answered and said, I knew it, I knew 
it is so of a truth. But how should man be just with God? See, there's the question that has come up. How can we be just with God? How can we live righteously with God? How does this thing actually occur? And when it does occur, how do we see ourselves? Job 1.1, 1, 1, it said that he was perfect. And that was God saying that Job was perfect. Not Job, but this was what God said. Notice verse 15 in chapter 9 of Job. It says, Whom though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication to my judge. So we see here that Job, a perfect man, is looking at himself. He says, if I was perfect, yet would I not answer. I would not even say such a word. It would not even come out of my mouth. Basically, that's what he's saying. And he's saying, I would make supplication to my judge. So if I was righteous, I would be crying to him and, you know, not looking at myself in that condition. Notice also what it says in verse number 20 and 21. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. So he is a perfect person who does not look at himself as perfect. But since God said he was perfect, we know he was perfect. But he sees himself that he says that when he opens his mouth, if he justifies himself in saying that he's perfect, he said the very words that say that would condemn him. And he says, if I was perverted, it would just prove me perverse because I'm still in sinful flesh. I'm still a sinful being. I have not arrived. I could fall any second, any moment. And the time that I think, and that's when I believe in Corinthians, um, Paul says that he that thinketh that he stand, take heed, lest he fall. So when people are telling you, yes, I'm perfect, I'm sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit and talking in tongues and this and that and the other and I'm all of this, wait a minute, that, that, that's not scriptural. Because the man who said, who God said was perfect, not he himself, he looked at himself not that way. So when you have come to the point that you think you have arrived, you can make for sure, according to Job, you have just fallen. Because you looking at yourself, not through the eyes of a person who was perfect. Notice verse number 21. It says, though I were perfect, Yet, I would not know my soul. I would despise my life. So he's letting us know, you know, even if he is perfect, that he would just say, no, I, I, I can't even accept that as a reality. I would not even know it. So those that say they know it, they really have not arrived. That's what Job is saying. I would despise my life. So that means you would be running away from such a thought passing through your mind to think that you have arrived. And so this is, you know, a very powerful um, scripture because we have a person who Yahweh has declared perfect, saying the exact opposite of what most some people not most people, all people, but some people <clears throat> are thinking or as some teachings would teach that, hey, everybody is okay. Once you accept Jesus, then you're perfect. You're, no, no, that's not, the Bible don't teach that. The Bible says that we are justified, then we are sanctified, and sanctification is a work of a lifetime. Now, okay, we, we talked about Job, we talked about some of them. I want to spend a little bit of time of us talking before we hit the 144,000, because the 144,000 are going to think like a Job, like a perfect person. These people are going to be living a life that's going to be similar to what Job did and um, what God had declared. So turn with me to the book 
book of John for a minute, chapter five. In the book of John, he goes through a lot of details. They call him the, um, the apostle of love, the beloved apostle. He writes a lot about love and perfection. And about, um, he writes on so many different things. Okay, in, in chapter five of the book of John, I'm going to look at verse number 19 here for a minute. Then answered Yeshua, or Jesus, and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also does the Son likewise. Now, this is very interesting. If we really look at what Yeshua is saying here, he says, I, that's Yeshua, who the Son, the Son, Yeshua, can do nothing of himself. Now, wait a minute. Some people believe and teach that Yeshua, Jesus, did everything, all the miracles, he did everything, he did this, he did that. But we hear reading that he's saying, wait a minute, no, 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 I didn't do anything. I can't do anything. Now, what is he saying here? But he says, okay, so you're telling me the miracles and all the different things that's happening. You're not doing it. Who's doing it? He's, he's letting him know that what? But that, but what he seeth the Father do, for so, for what things soever the Father doeth, these also do with the son likewise. So all he is doing is taking orders or taking examples from the father. That's all he's doing. He is not the one that is just um, going around doing all of these things of himself. Now, how much can we do in righteousness and holiness? We're in the same condition as your, what Yeshua said here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself. Nothing. Does that mean that he cannot keep himself? Is he in the same condition that we're in? That he has to depend on the Holy Spirit and the Father to live in him and reveal himself to the world? That was the role of Adam. That's why he's called the second Adam. The role of Adam was Adam could do nothing of himself neither, but he could choose to do right or he can choose to do wrong. If he chose to do right, then the Holy Spirit would be revealed to him. That's why they were created in the image of God such that, that, that the Godhead or Elohim could dwell in them such that the world would not see Adam, but that they would see Yeshua, they would see the Father, they would see the Holy Spirit being revealed through Adam. So this is what we're saying is happening here. That when Yeshua was here on the planet, that he was being, was revealing to the world the Father. And so it is with us that we have to do the same thing. Notice verse number 30. It says, I, this is Yeshua talking, I can of mine own self do nothing. See, here it is again. He's saying it again. Why does he keep saying that? That's the first question we need to try to understand. Because he's trying to help us realize that he is in the same position that we were in, that we are in. There's nothing righteous we can do. All of our righteousness, the Bible says, is until two acts. And he says there's nothing he can do of himself. I can do, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge as he hears from who he hears from the father and the Holy spirit. And then it's what they're saying that he listens to. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the father, which sent me. Now notice what he's saying here. Also, 
he's also saying that, you know, we have a will. That means we can choose to do right or wrong. Adam and Eve had the choice to choose. And so they have a will and a choice, a mechanism. And we see here that he is telling the people that he's talking to that, hey, I don't seek my will. I do the will of the Father which sent him. So the same thing is we have to get to the point that we are not, that, that we yield our will so much over to the Holy Spirit so that it is no longer our will, but the will of the Father. It's the will of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the contention is. The contention is which will we choose? That's why when we read in Romans chapter 7, um, well, let's turn there for a second because that's a very important verse there. In Romans chapter 7 where we actually see the contest actually in the individual. In the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7. And Romans chapter 7 deals all the whole thing with the... Um, man as he um, is fighting and held captivity to the will of Satan and all of those things. So we see here he's in a big struggle and there's nothing he can do. And he tells us what condition he finds himself in. I'm going to skip around a few verses here. Okay. Lift me from okay. We start off here at verse number nine. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandments came, sin revived and I died. So basically all he's just saying here is without the law, and many people don't believe in the law of God, the Ten Commandments anymore. They just, you know, throw them out. Even Christians, they don't believe in the Ten Commandments. They believe in some of them and throw out the rest. So... But he makes it here. He says that as long as I didn't have the commandments, hey, I was doing fine. I could do whatever I want. Everything was fine and it didn't matter. But he says, as soon as the commandments came, then I saw what sin was or sin came alive or revived. And then I have to decide to die, die to self, die daily. Verse 10, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be to death. Now, many of us find that the commandments, you know, shows us that we are wrong and that we're not living right and things aren't correct and all of those different things. And so, was it created for that? No, it was created, the Bible says it was created for life to show you that this is the life that you're living. And this life, because you're living this life, this is the life of the life of the Holy Spirit. And so he said that when he came to that, then he found that he was dead because he was violating these commandments and the, the Bible, basically. And because he was violating them, he saw that he was really dead. He wasn't alive, even though people say that, hey, hey, I'm free. I'm free to choose right or wrong. I'm free to do, you know, but once you choose sin, then you're a slave to sin. And so he realized that and he said that he was dead. He wasn't, he didn't have life because he was violating the thing that gave life or that thing that told you you had life, which was the commandments. Now, notice verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandments, deceived me. Deceive them? Yes. The, the sin has been deceiving us. Most of the time, sin is just running rampant in our lives and we don't know it. Or we say that we're under the blood and no one can be perfect, so we justify it. I mean, we fall, but there's no question about that because the Bible says that we have, you know, that all have fallen short of the glory of Yahweh. So we agree with that. But he's just making mention, instead of throwing out the commandments, which tells you you have life and shows you you have life, that's what people do. And he says that that's what, that's what the deception is. Sin has deceived us that we can continue in sin and it will be all right. And as um, Bobby read earlier, he made mention that um, that because people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil, and that's the condemnation. 
The condemnation isn't that it's there. And so when you come to the point that you see that our lives are not good, then we have two choices. We can continue in sin and let it continue to deceive us, as Paul put it here in Romans, deceived me, and he slew him, killed him. Okay, and notice verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? And he's saying, well, wait a minute. The commandments which is holy, which is just, which is good, which I'm supposed to be living in harmony with, I find myself living out of harmony with it. Is something wrong with the commandments? Can I throw them away? Because I say I'm under the blood of Jesus, I'm okay. But let's see what it says. Okay, in verse 13 he says, was then that which is good, the commandments, made death unto me? God forbid. For sin, that it might appear sin. So without the commandments, without the Bible, we don't know what sin is. And we continue in it because we don't read our Bibles. And we don't know no better. So he says, but when you're reading your Bible, when the commandments come, when, when it actually comes to you, then you will be able to see. For maybe your first time. That it is sin. That is killing me. So he makes mention, was then that which is good, the commandments made death unto me, God forbid, for sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. So there he's telling us that when we look at the Bible and as we read the Bible every day, we're seeing things in our lives that aren't in harmony with it. We can go along with it and change and pray to the Holy Spirit. And that's what Job was saying. And that every day things are coming up. So he has to constantly yield to the Holy Spirit. And as you develop that, then that's when light comes into the world. And because people love darkness or love the sinfulness, if they choose the darkness rather than the light, that's when the condemnation comes. So he's saying right here that now once he sees that the commandment is showing him that he is exceedingly sinful, that we are, you know, all our righteousness are filthy rags, all that we're exceedingly sinful, what will we do at that point? Will we come to the light, continue to read the Bible and try to understand it, or will we just go away from it and not read the Bible but still want to be called Christian? That's what this discussion of chapter 7 is all about. It's a heavy chapter. For we know that the law is spiritual. So the law is dealing with the spiritual man, not the physical man, but the spiritual man. But I am carnal. All under sin. And when Adam and Eve fell, that's where they brought us. They brought us under condemnation. That's that we were in the condition, um, we were like on the slave block, and we were being auctioned off. Adam and Eve auctioned us off to Lucifer. And so he became our slave master. And so that's why he says that we are carnal, soul under sin. So that's what we saw. We're, we're born to sin and we come to sin. And so Yeshua has come to give us life. But first we have to see that we are fallen in that condition before he can give us life. So that we can start following the Bible and what he's actually telling us to do so that we might be able to understand that this deals with the spiritual individual. For that which I do, I allow not. He says what I that what I do is, is not what I want to do. For what I would, what I want to do, that do I not. So he's saying I want to follow the commandments. I want to follow, and I find myself I cannot, or I'm not doing it. But what I hate, and that's what he's saying. He hates sin, but what I hate, that do I. I find myself doing it all the time. And that is the dilemma that we find ourselves in today. If then I do that which I would not, or I do what I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. 
Now, some today will say, yes, I can sin, that I'm continuing to sin. So if I throw out the Ten Commandments and I throw out the Bible, then guess what? And I'm not sinning no more because I don't see it. And that's a nothing but a deception. That's what he said earlier. That's a deception. And so some people say that the Ten Commandments have been nailed to the cross. So if they're nailed to the cross, that means what? That means I can never see if I'm following Yahweh or if I'm following myself. Because now you're your only um, test. And then we, you, you, uh, the usual quoted, or the spirit um, within me tells me I'm the spirit. I have, I am the son of God. Well, the spirit, I mean, which spirit are we talking about? Job didn't even say that. So when we are um, at this lax condition, as I will call it, of just falling in line with stuff, that's not quite what the Bible is trying to tell us. Notice the next verse. If then I do that which I would not, he's saying I'm still doing what I don't want to do, I consent that the law, that it is good. Now and then, it is no more I that do it. Well, wait a minute. How can Paul be saying here that he's sinning and he's doing what he don't want to do, what he hates? He's violating the laws of God. And then he comes back and says, wait a minute. Hey, wait. I don't do that. Somebody else is doing that. Well, wait a minute. So this is a very important part. What do you mean somebody else is doing or something else is doing? What do you mean I am not doing it? Let's look at 17 again. Now then, it is, it is no more I that do it. That's sinning. That's what he's talking about. But sin that dwells in me. Now, some people didn't know that because we're in sinful flesh, sin dwells in the sinful flesh. That's why it's called sinful flesh. And so... Under this condition, is there any hope? Let's see what else happens here. Verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So now I can understand why Job was saying, even if I was perfect, I can't even believe it. Because he knew that he was being tempted all the time and he could fall anytime. And he sees here that he realizes also that there's nothing good in his flesh because of sinful flesh. Sinful flesh has the propensity to sin. And that's what it loves and that's what it does. Automatic. You don't even have to think about it. It's right there. And so that's what he is saying here. For I know that is in me. That is in my flesh. In the sinful flesh dwells no good thing. For to will... So he has a will. See, there's the will again that we were talking about earlier. But for to will is present with me. He says, I have a will and I want to choose what is right. That's present. I'm doing that. I'm choosing. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. So I might desire to do what is good. But I don't surrender everything so that I can do what is good because in my flesh dwells the law of sin dwells sinfulness that's all it's that's why that's why it's called sinful flesh for the good that i would i do not but the evil which i would not that i do there he goes again that's verse 19 he's telling hey all the good stuff i would do i can't find to do it but all the evil stuff i would oh man i'm just doing now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it. There it is again. He said it again. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Sin that dwells in the sinful flesh. That's what he's saying. That's what's actually performing it. And all of us are going through this. All of us have to go through this. This is There is no exception of no one not going through this. Now, the catch is, where will you choose to hold your will? Will you hide behind, I got Jesus, so it don't matter? Or are you going to try to surrender all to Yeshua? Okay? Now, you will fall up and down, so we're not saying that you're perfect, 
but Yahweh wants to bring us to perfection, and that's where we must strive to go. Or, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, verse 20, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law. When I would do good, evil is present with me. And 144,000 goes through this too. Yeshua has to go through this too. Everybody has to go through this. Now, some will say, no, Yeshua was exempt. He did not have to fight the flesh, okay? But we'll, we'll read a little more. Just so we can find out, you know, did he go through this? And that's where the debate. Will 144,000 go through this? It will everyone who's born on earth go through this if you're living in sinful flesh? That's the question. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So he sees that there's a law. There's a law of good, the Ten Commandments, which deals with the spiritual man, and then there's the law of sin. For I delight in the law of God. That's what he says in verse number 22. I delight in the law of God. Now, all of us, we know we delight in the law of God, in God and his word. After the inward man, so that's the inward individual or the spirit that is striving to bring us to that point. Because that is where life is in the inner being. But I see another law. My members, warring against the law of my mind. So we have how many laws here? He says, I see another law. He says, I want to do good, in verse 22, I delight in the law of God, so there's one law. And then he says, I see another law. And my memory says, wait a minute, what is he saying? Is there more than one law? I thought there was only the Ten Commandments, the law of God, the laws that he had put in the Bible. No, there's many laws. There's the laws of the universe. Gravity, that's a law. If you violate it, you are destroyed. If you decide that you want to jump, off of a high building because you think you can fly, that's not going to happen. And so the law of gravity will bring it down, bring you down. So there's different laws for different things. So we have to study and understand all of God's laws, even his health laws, all of his laws. So, but anyway, he's telling us here that there is the law of God. And he says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. So now we got another law. That he says is the law of his mind. That's where his will is, what he's choosing. I want to do this. I want to do this. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So here he's letting us know that there's another law that he's been dealing with all of this time. And it's called the law of sin. And it brings us into captivity, all of our members. And so this is the struggle. So at the end of this chapter, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. That's why Job said, hey, if I thought I was perfect, hey, I can't even, I can't, I can't, I can't believe it. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the Lord of Elohim, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, see, this is a very deep chapter of the experience of everybody on the planet, no matter who you are. Then notice in verse 8, I mean, the next chapter, he says, therefore, I mean, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And that's where most people stop. But how do you know if you're in Christ Jesus? Because I accepted him, that's what they say. Well, I mean, the, 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 the devil knows Jesus and he trembled, the Bible says. So just because you say you know Jesus don't mean that you really know him. So how do you know if you know him? Well, they said the spirit within me verifies the spirit of the flesh. Well, that, that, that that's a good point, but how do you know? Well, he tells you. You don't have to guess. He tells you. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You know that you're in Christ Jesus when this occurs. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's where you tell. It's not by what you said. It wasn't what Job said. It was what Job did. 
It was what Yahweh said Job was because he walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life. Now, how do we get that? How do we walk after the spirit? For the law of the spirit of life. There's another law. See, we thought there was only the Ten Commandments, which we read earlier. With the law of sin, which we read earlier. The law of the mind, which we read earlier. Okay? We read about all of these laws in this chapter that we just read, chapter 7. And now we see another law, the law of the spirit. Now, most people didn't know that the spirit, the Holy Spirit, has a law that governs him. And that's heavy. Now, we got to talk about laws that govern God. Yes, God is bound by his own laws. That's why it's called the law of the spirit, of life. Now, this law of the spirit gives life and is life. And guess where it's found? It's found in the Messiah. That's what it says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. From the law of sin. Wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about in chapter 7? Chapter 7, the man was dominated by the law of sin. That's why he said, I want to do right, I can't do right. Because I find another law, the law of sin dwelling in my members. What do you mean to take captivity to the law of sin? So now he says in chapter 8, wait a minute. If you have now the law of the spirit, which comes with the Holy Spirit, which was also found in Yeshua the Messiah or in Christ, that is what's going to make us free from the law of sin and death. And so that's how the Messiah got the victory. He didn't get the victory just because he says, hey, I'm just God, so I do whatever I want. And, hey, I can do this, do that, and so that's all that matters. No, he was yielded over to the Father. And the Holy Spirit lived through him and showed his will. Let's look at John chapter 6 for a minute. Now, in John chapter 6, it deals with more of what we were just talking about there, of how Yeshua got the victory. So as we can see, this guy in chapter 7, you know, us human beings, that we are under the law of sin. And we have to get the Holy Spirit so that it can give us the victory. It can free us from the law of sin. Okay, so notice in chapter 6 of John, verse number 38, it says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So now, that's what's the difference in Romans 6, I mean 7 and 8. We find the person in Romans 8 saying that he, hey, my will, I'm choosing to give my will to the Father, to the Holy Spirit. And that's what Yeshua, that's how he was able to get the victory. Notice what he says, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, my, my own ideas, my own this, my own that. No, I didn't come down to do that. But the will of him that sent me. Okay, now the question is, are we choosing the will of the Father? Can we do that? Notice verse number 44. No man, so chapter 6 of John, can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. So notice what he's saying here, that we have to be drawn. No one comes of his own. And so we have to be drawn by the Holy Spirit. So that's what we, that, that's where he, that is what he is doing. And so that's where we are. He wants to be revealed in and through us. Now notice in verse number um, 63 of chapter 6. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profit nothing. The words which I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So he's letting us know that what quickens us so that we can get the victory, as we read in chapters 7 and 8, 
with paralleling this with chapter seven and eight is that the holy spirit is the spirit and that's what it says when we that that there's therefore no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk not after the spirit i mean no not after the flesh but after the spirit and he just made mention that also that what that we are free from the law of sin and death through the spirit the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death so this is what he's saying here once the spirit it is the spirit that quickens it's the law of the spirit that enables us to get the victory and so it is for us now notice in verse number 57 also he says as the living father has sent me and i live by the father so oh, he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. So he's telling us here how he's getting the victory. He says, as the Father, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. So the Father was what? Living in him. That's what, what Adam and what Steve was supposed to reveal, he did. He revealed to the world the Father. Not himself. And that's where the debate is. Did Yeshua come and do everything of his own, or did he yield everything over to his father? And that all he did was do what the father had him do. It wasn't him that did the healing. It wasn't him that did all of these different things. Now, some might be saying, well, I never heard this before. This is like, wait a minute. This sounds interesting, but I've never heard this before. Well, let's, let's see, because now remember, we're coming straight out of Scripture. We're not trying to create stuff. Now, look also in the book of John, chapter 8, starting at verse number 28. He deals with that again. Then said Yeshua, Jesus, unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. There it is again. Wait a minute. He says he doesn't do anything of himself. That's the Roman experience, Roman chapter 7 and Roman chapter 8. Roman chapter 7 experience, he was doing everything of himself. And we just making a mess in chapter 7. And then when the law of the spirit of life came, that was in Christ Jesus, had made me free. Notice it was in Christ Jesus. So he's telling us that the law of the spirit was in Yeshua, and now this is what he's telling us. Okay, I can do nothing of myself, but as my father has taught me, I speak these things and he that sent me is with me what does it mean is he with him does it mean that he's living in him yes he is living in him the father the son and the holy spirit were all dwelling in yeshua because the bible says that in him dwelt the fullness of the godhead bodily all of it and he that sent me is with me the father has not left me alone why for I do always those things. Amen. That please him. And so how is he able to do always those things that please him? Because he yielded himself over to the law of the spirit. And through the law of the spirit, the holy, there's three major components in us. One, as we were reading in chapter seven, one is the will. And you have to give your will over to the Father. And that's what he did. You have to give your will over to God. And so he, Yeshua is telling us here that he gave his will. He didn't do his own will. He did the will of the Father. So he yielded his will to the Father. And then once he is able to yield his will to the Father through the law of the spirit of life, freed him from the law of sin that dwelt in all of our members. So he's saying that's what we have to do, the exact same thing. We have to be willing to yield everything over, to give our will over to choosing what is right through, the, of, through Yeshua. And as we yield and give that over to him, then the law of the spirit of life can be revealed through us and we will be like Yeshua. Notice verse number 38 of chapter 8. I speak that which I have seen my father and ye do that which ye have seen of your father 
So we see there again, that's Romans 7, and that's Romans 8. And so it's very important that we start to be able to see of how Yeshua did get the victory. He didn't get the victory just because he um, just because he was God. He got the victory because he yielded everything over. Now, some was saying, well, wait a minute. Well, he was God, so he, he didn't have to go that. Well, let's turn to Hebrews just for a quick second. Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1 tells you specifically of God or of Yeshua in heaven as, as above all things. It says, God, who in sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the Father by the prophets, had in his last day spoken unto us by his son, whom he have appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So he's letting us know that Yeshua made the worlds, and that's what he's talking about here. Notice verse number five in chapter one. For unto which of the angels that he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be unto him a father, and he shall be unto me. And then verse number seven, and of the angels, he says, who made his angels spirits and his ministers flames of fire. So here he's talking specifically about that him in heaven, that he's above everything. He's the creator of the universe and everything. Now in chapter two, it's just another individual. He's showing Yeshua as coming as a man, not as coming as God. Notice what it says, verse 1. Therefore ye ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any times we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, a reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Okay, and then it goes down to verse number four, um, about also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his will. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak but one in a certain place testified saying what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visited him thou madest him this is humans a little lower than angels did you get that we were made lower than angels we wasn't made above the angels so when we're converted and we accept Yeshua, we're not, we're not above the angels. No. The Bible says that crystal clear. We're converted below the angel. Okay? And it says here, and crowned, thou crownest him with glory and honor. Yes, yeah, so we do have glory and honor. That's why Adam and Eve were given the whole planet to run. And did send him and did set him over the works of his hand. That's what the Bible says. That's Genesis chapter 1. And two, thou didst put all things in subjection under his feet. Chapter one, dominion. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that was not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So everything he gave us on the planet, he put underneath us. And then he says that now he didn't, he hasn't shown us everything that he puts underneath us. And then now in verse nine, he changes up and now he talks about Yeshua in for chapter one as the creator. In the beginning of chapter two, he talks about man and how he created us that dominion and to reveal him to the world. Now in verse nine, it picks up and he says, but we see Jesus or Yeshua who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So now we don't see Jesus above the angels in chapter two. That's not what it says here. He says, but now we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels when he came in sinful flesh. He came to be like us. 
what, for what purpose? For the suffering of death. For he could not die as the son of God in chapter 1, as the creator. He couldn't die. So he says that he gave up his divinity so that he can become like man to get his victory. And that he can bring us back to the state of Adam. That's what he's saying. The plan that he had for Adam and Eve has not been forgotten and is not lost. But it is now being revealed through his son and to all of them that yield to him, like Job, like Enoch. And so, like Elijah. People were translated in all of these different things. And just like the 144,000, that's why we're building into the 144. Who are they? What does it take for them to be the 144? What did Yahweh do to them? What was Yahweh trying to reveal in them? That's what the goal is. That's what he's trying to bring us back to. And so that's what he said. So he sent us an example of how he would do it. And that's why I was trying to explain earlier of how Yeshua got the victory, the same way we get the victory. That the Holy Spirit has to dwell in us and then it, through the law of the Spirit, will have us free from the law of sin and death. Not because you said Jesus. No, no, it wasn't because you said Jesus. A lot of people say Jesus, but that, that, that's not the truth. It's, it's if you walk in the Spirit. But you can't walk in the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit. And so that's what it was talking about, the law of the spirit of life in Yeshua the Messiah. But we see Jesus, so it says verse 9, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, or Elohim, should taste death for every man. For it became of him, for whom are all things, Right? He's the creator. He created all things. And by whom are all things? In bringing many sons to glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect. There we go. So here the Bible tells us, shows us that Yeshua was made lower than the angels. Verse 9. And he says that here in verse number 10, that he is the captain of our salvation and he was made perfect. Through suffering. To make the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. So the reason why we have to suffer is that's bringing us through perfection. Just as it did for him. But most of us don't want to suffer. And because we don't want to suffer, then we don't get on the path. And we just say, all I need is Jesus. That's not what the book says. The Bible don't teach so Jesus says that there'll be many come up in his name. He says, I know Jesus. He said, yes. He says, I never heard of you. I never knew you. He didn't say that you fell and didn't fall. He said, I never knew you. So just to confess the name of Jesus is not enough, according to the Bible. But that's where everybody wants to stay, because that's the easy way out. You don't have to suffer, as Yeshua did. He said he was made perfect to make the captain of their salvation perfect. Through suffering. So that means what? Notice verse 11. For both he that sanctifies, that's the Holy Spirit, that's Yeshua, and he and they who are sanctified, that's us, as we yield over to him, are all one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So he's not ashamed to call us brethren if we what? If we go through the trials and tribulation and we allow the Holy Spirit to live in us, we're just not by a name. It's not like that, as they would have us to believe. Notice the last verse, verse 18. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or keep them that are tempted. So he's letting us know that what? that he's able to keep us. And there's no temptation that is not, that's common to man that he is not going to give us the victory over. But we have to yield to him as he yielded to the Father. So he was able to get the victory. As we yield to the Holy Spirit and God, 
and we get the victory. Everyone can get the same victory, provided we yield all to him. And so that's what Romans chapter 6 and 7 was dealing with. That's what Job had come to the point to realize. That is what Yeshua lived through. That is what the 144,000 yield. And when we come back, we're going to look at um, our third and last portion. And that part will show us how Daniel, where the Bible says that Daniel was beloved of God. Why? What did he go through? He was given many dreams and visions, even for the last days, to prepare us for a time of the end. 